Welcome and thank you for attending the Black History Matter series presented by the National Abolition Hall of Fame and Museum. My name is Victoria Basuto and I am a current senior at Colgate University located in Hamilton, New York, and am an intern with the National Abolition Hall of Fame and Museum known as NAHOF. I will be facilitating the series of 28 presentations that will be released throughout the month of February 2021 and that you can view on our YouTube channel or on our website. I will now lead you through some introductory statements. The National Abolition Hall of Fame and Museum is located in Peterborough, New York, in the building that you can see on the screen where the inaugural meeting of the New York State Anti-Slavery Society was held in 1835. Nehoff's mission is as follows. The National Abolition Hall of Fame and Museum honors anti-slavery abolitionists, their work to end slavery and the legacy of that struggle, and strives to complete the second and ongoing abolition, the moral conviction to end racism. Nehoff has worked in coordination with the Garrett Smith Estate National Historic Landmark, which is also located in Peterborough, New York, to create the Black History Matter series. The following statement is the purpose of the Black History Matter series. Nehoff supports racial justice movements seeking to address racial inequality given their resonance with Nehoff's mission to address the second and ongoing abolition to end racism. Nehoff believes a significant number of Americans do not understand the current racial justice protest due to their unfamiliarity with four centuries of Black American history because this history was either excluded or taught inadequately in schools. Nehoff knows that education is a powerful step towards ending racism and that understanding the history of the enslavement and dehumanization of Black Americans provides critical context for the ongoing racial justice movements and the persistence of racism in America. Given Nehoff's commitment to strengthening knowledge of history as one route to confront racism, Nehoff will present Black History Matters, a series of crash courses covering some examples of neglected topics in Black American history throughout the month of February in 2021. I'd like to now welcome our first presenter, Dr. Cernan. Dr. Cernan is Professor Emeritus of African American Studies and History at Syracuse University. He is a founding member of the National Abolition Hall of Fame and Museum and a member of the Cabinet of Freedom. Cernan's many publications include Abolitions Acts, Beriah Green, Anita Institute, and the Black Freedom Struggle, North Star Country, Upstate New York and the Crusade for African American Freedom, and Harriet Tubman, Myth, Memory, and History. I'd like to now welcome Dr. Cernet to begin his presentation on the Christiana Resistance. The Christiana Resistance took place at Christiana, Pennsylvania on September 11th, 1851, when Edward Gorshak, a slave owner from Maryland, attempted to recapture several runaways under the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 at the house of William Parker, himself once enslaved. Parker and the freedom seekers engaged in a fight with the Gorsuch Posse. The Christiana resistance, as Frederick Douglass said, proved that fugitives themselves were determined to destroy the Fugitive Slave Act. What happened at Christiana was, like John Brown's raid upon Harper's Ferry, a prelude to the Civil War. In 1896, two elderly African-American men returned to a ruined house south of Christiana, Pennsylvania. Samuel Hopkins, seen here holding aloft a corn knife, and Peter Woods were the last survivors of the African-Americans who defied the Fugitive Slave Bill of 1850 by defending four freedom seekers who had escaped from Maryland. When you visit southeastern Lancaster County, Pennsylvania and drive along Lower Valley Road, south of Christiana, you will find this historical marker dedicated in 1998. It is located near where the house of William Parker, himself an escapee from the South's so-called peculiar institution stood. Though accurate in noting what happened at Parker's house on September 11th, 1851, 
that the riot did much to polarize the national debate over slavery, the marker by labeling the Institute a riot does not tell the full story. First, we need some background. Enslaved African-Americans have been running away to freedom long before 1850. But in that year, the United States Congress enacted the Fugitive Slave Bill, which was then signed by President Millard Fillmore. This law federalized the problem of the slave South was having with increasing numbers of runaways and levied severe penalties on anyone who assisted a freedom seeker. The 1850 Fugitive Slave Law. Law enforcement officials who chose not to arrest alleged runaway slaves could be fined $1,000, approximately $26,600 today. A claimant's sworn testimony was sufficient for an arrest. No jury trial could be given, nor could the suspected runaway provide testimony. Any citizen aiding an escaped slave could be fined $1,000 and or ser serve jail time. The federal official got $5 if the runaway was freed, but $10 if not. A Maryland planter in rural Baltimore County awoke on the morning of November 7th, 1849 to discover that four males whom he had enslaved had fled. He sounded an alarm and met with a small group of other Southerners, including his son Dickinson Gorsius, at the Gorsius Tavern to form a posse to cross over into Pennsylvania and try to recapture the four runaways. The four freedom seekers had found refuge in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, where anti-slavery minded Quakers and fellow African Americans gave them aid. Their names were Josh Hamlin, Nelson Ford, George Hamlin, and Noah Bully. Early on the morning of September 11th, 1851, Gorsuch and the other slave hunters approached the house of William and Eliza Parker. William Parker had escaped from slavery to Maryland some years earlier. The Parker house stood on the Palmo track owned by a Quaker farmer. The raiders in the Gorsuch party included a U.S. Marshal. The Marshal declared that the Fugitive Slave Bill of 1850 mandated that those in the Parker house give up the two runaways who were sheltered there. Eliza Parker blew a horn from the upper story of the house to signal local blacks and their white allies that an attack was underway. William Parker and those in the household moved to the second floor, armed and prepared to defend themselves against the armed posse. Perhaps as many as 100 African Americans Many of them armed with guns and corn knives heeded the call to come to the aid of the fugitives that Parker was sheltering, as well as Parker himself, who was now in violation of the 1850 Fugitive Slave Bill. A smaller number of unarmed white men, some of them Quakers, also gathered at the Parker House to defend its inhabitants. A fight ensued though it is unclear who fired the first shot. Edward Gorsuch tried to recapture Samuel Thompson. Thompson clubbed him. The others among the rescuers shot Gorsuch and killed him. When Dickinson Gorsuch went to the aid of his father, he was wounded. He was taken to the nearby Levi, Pon Levi Pano house and survived. He returned to Maryland and swore revenge upon the North along with his schoolmate, John Wilkes Booth, who later assassinated President Abraham Lincoln. John W. Ashmead, pictured here, was the U.S. attorney who prosecuted 41 of the rescuers for having violated the 
Fugitive Slave Bill of 1850. 37 of those charged were black, including William Parker and the four runaways. William Parker had to be tried in absentia as he had fled north before the trial. He reached Rochester, New York, where he was given shelter by Frederick Douglass and then crossed over to Canada West, Ontario today. Douglas had known William Parker when both men were enslaved in Maryland. Thaddeus Stevens, a staunch abolitionist from Lancaster, Pennsylvania, who was to become a leader of the radical Republicans in Congress, successfully defended the Christiana resistors against the charge of treason against the United States. Armed with corn cutters, clubs, and a few muskets, and headed by a miller in a felt hat, without a coat, without arms, and mounted on a sorrel nag, those charged levied war against the United States. These are the words that Thaddeus Stevens used in irony in his defense of the Christiana resistors. Pictured here are three of the whites who participated in the Christiana resistance. On the left, we see Castor Hanway, a Quaker miller, who is said to be the leader of the so-called Christiana riot, as if the African-American resistors played a secondary role in the 1851 incident. Thaddeus Stevens successfully defended Hanway. The jury acquitted Hanway in just 15 minutes. Eliza, William Parker's wife, joined him in Canada West in November 1851. The Parkers settled near Buxton in Canada West. The house where the Christiana resistance took place eventually fell into ruin. In this picture, we see the abandoned house with the Palno farm in the background. Here, archeologists excavate the site of the Parker House. This is a contemporary view of the Christiana resistance site, the day an Amish farmer owns the land. Pictured here is the souvenir program of a commemoration of the event. The commemoration was held in 1911 Note that the event is described as the Christiana riot. Since 1911, there has been a change of historical perspective. And what took place on September 11th, 1851 is now referred to as the Christiana resistance. This underscores the role that African-Americans took fighting against the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. This historical marker, located at the intersection of Green Street and Slocum Avenue in Christiana, was erected at the time of the 1911 commemoration. Note that it describes Edward Gorsius, the slave owner, as having died for law. This monument also lists the names of those who were indicted for treason and informs the public that Castor Hanway, who was found not guilty, had suffered for freedom. The Rotary Club of Octorora and the Christiana Historical Society dedicate a special marker to the memory of William Parker. The phrase, bold as a lion, comes from one of Parker's fellow abolitionists. Perhaps Frederick Douglass said it best in his third autobiography. The thing which more than all else destroyed the fugitive slave law was the resistance made to it by the fugitives themselves. This artist's rendering of the Parker House with the Palnell farm in the background seems peaceful enough. But had you been present at the home of William 
and Eliza Parker on that foggy morning of September 11th, 1851, you would have been witness to what was to come in the Civil War when the swords of liberty and those of slavery clashed on the battlefield. Like John Brown's raid upon the federal arsenal at Harper's Ferry in 1859, the Christiana resistance of 1851 was an important prelude to the Civil War. African-Americans demonstrated at the Parker House in 1851 that they would not let slavery stand. I'd like to thank Dr. Cernet for that educational presentation. If you're interested in learning more about this topic, Dr. Cernet has provided a reference list of sources with websites that you can explore to learn more. This reference list will be listed in the video description. I will also invite you to fill out a quick survey linked in the video description, which will help us gather feedback about the specific topic. This survey would take you no more than five minutes to fill out and will provide us with valuable information that would help us in the formation of future presentations like this one. Should you have any questions regarding the presentation itself, Dr. Cernet has made his email available so that you may contact him with any questions or comments you may have. Additionally, please do contact Nehoff with any questions or if you're interested in learning more about the organization and its work. Nehoff's contact information is available on the screen. Once again, I'd like to thank Dr. Cernet for providing a program for the Black History Matters presentation. I would also like to thank you, the audience, for joining us on this educational journey. Please remember we will be releasing a new presentation each day this February. We hope that you will join us at our future presentations. Thank you.